Welcome to week seven, part one. This lecture, or part one of the lecture, is going to focus on fluid and electrolyte imbalances. We will focus on hyper and hypovolemia, dehydration, and sodium and potassium imbalances. So our body is constantly trying to keep us in a state of equilibrium, which is homeostasis. And so we have a many, many different adaptive responses in our body that enable us to remain in equilibrium. And we spoke about AVGs a couple of classes ago and the ability for our body to work through our lungs and our kidneys to try and restore our acid-base balance. And so body fluids and electrolytes play a very important role in homeostasis. Many diseases and their treatments can affect fluid and electrolyte imbalances. And this is probably one of the most common areas in your placements and practice settings that you will every single patient will have fluid and electrolyte imbalances. And so if you're working with chemotherapy patients, for example, and a lot of chemotherapy drugs cause nausea and vomiting, and so they subsequently cause dehydration and acid-base imbalances. And you see this with every single type of patient that you come in contact with, the disorders of fluid and electrolyte imbalance. So just a quick review on the fluid distribution. We have our intracellular fluid compartment, which is primarily where potassium is housed, and our extracellular fluid compartment where sodium is housed. And so the intracellular compartment, that's the fluid that's contained with, within all the cells in our bodies. It's larger with respect to our extracellular fluid compartment, and two thirds of the body's water is found in the intracellular compartment and its high concentration of potassium. The extracellular compartment comprises our, the last, the remaining one third of our body water, and it's all the fluid outside the cell. So it includes the inter, interstitial spaces, which are your tissues, and it also includes the plasma and the vascular compartments, so our blood components, and it's a, it has a high concentration of sodium. So electrolytes, they are substance, substances that can separate into solution to form charged particles or ions. And then we also have non-electrolytes, which do not separate into ions, such as glucose and urea. There's different types of ions. A cation is positively charged ion, which are potassium and sodium, and an anion, which is negatively charged ion, which is chloride and bicarb. Ions can be exchanged for one another if they carry the same charge. And so we see that with our sodium potassium pump, as well as potassium and hydrogen ions in our acid base balance. So we measure electrolytes in the international standard, which is millimoles per liter. And just to remember again, in the intracellular fluid compartment, uh, the prevalent cation is potassium and the prevalent anion is phosphate. And in the extracellular fluid compa uh, compartment, the main cation is sodium and the prevalent anion is chloride. So it's important to understand those. So just a little bit of a memory jogger. Uh, we know fluids are constantly on the move, seeking to keep the body in equilibrium. And how do they do that? Well, they do it through three ways, diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. So diffusion is just the movement of solutes from areas of high concentration to areas of lower concentration. The membrane is permeable to water and solutes, and it does not require any input of energy. Facilitated diffusion is passing through a transporter, so something helps the ions move back and forth. Osmosis is what we're going to focus on, and it's the diffusion of water molecules from a low to a high concentration because the membrane is not permeable to solutes. And then active transport is energy is required to pump uphill against the concentration gradient, and we see that with our sodium potassium pump. But for our fluid and electrolyte balances, we're going to focus on the movement of water, which is osmosis. So osmosis refers to the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Semi-permeable means that it's permeable to water, 
but it's not permeable to, mo permeable to most solutes. And in osmosis, it's the water that's moving back and forth. And so the concentration gradient of molecules between compartments is kept equal through this movement of water, this osmotic movement of water. It moves from a low solute to a high solute concentration. So osmosis is the pulling of water. So water is pulled from an area of low concentration or low solute to a high solute concentration. Osmosis stops when the concentration difference disappears or when the hydrostatic pressure builds and is sufficient to oppose any further movement of water. So let's look at this diagram here. So in an active cell, there's a constant exchange of substances between departments because they, they want to have, they don't want to have a net gain or a loss of water. So they want to make it equal. So as you can see in this diagram, we have albumin here. We have 5% of albumin on this side of the semi-permeable semi-permeable membrane and 10% of albumin here. And so albumin doesn't move across. What happens is, is the water moves across. And so you see how the water is moving back and forth to come out with the net uh, equilibrium of 7.5% of albumin on both sides. And so water moves between fluid compartments, the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid through the osmotic pressure, this pulling of water pressure. And so as water moves across the semipermeable membrane, it generates a pressure called osmotic pressure. So we can actually measure the osmotic activity of a solution, this pulling power of a solution. And it measures the solute concentration of a solution. So think of your IV solutions, ones with a high solute concentration versus a low solute concentration, so that pulling power. And osmolality refers to the osmolar concentration or the solute concentration in one kilogram of water. So how much pulling pressure does a solute concentration have in a solution? Now we can also check an individual's or a client's serum or blood osmolality. And why would you think that an MD or an MP would order this test? Well, we want to figure out the solute concentration in someone's body. We want to figure out the fluid balance between sodium and water because we know that water is attracted by sodium. And so our normal blood osmolality is 275 to 295 milliosmolalities per kilogram of water. So I was talking about that before. If we have a high blood serum osmolality, it means we have hypernatremia. There's a high concentration of salt in the body, and that could mean dehydration, the pulling of water out of the cells. If it's low, we have hyponatremia, and we may have excess water in our cells. There's the, the, there's that lack of pulling power. And so you will see um, in critical care settings, in step-down settings, serum blood osmolality ordered. So let's look at fluid imbalances. So we're going to start off with hypovolemia and fluid volume deficit. So there is a difference between hypovolemia and dehydration. Hypovolemia is defined as the state of decreased blood volume, but more specifically the plasma. So what is plasma? So plasma is that clear straw colored liquid portion of the blood that remains after the red blood cells and the white blood cells, platelets and other cellular components are removed. It is the single largest component of human blood and it represents 55% and contains water, salts, enzyme, antibodies and other proteins. And so it makes up the largest portion of the human blood. So when we look at hypovolemia, yes, we look at decreased blood volume, but it looks at a lot of other than just the actual blood in the blood cells in the blood. And it differs from dehydration, which is defined as an excessive loss of body water. So there is a difference. People tend to use these in um, similar language, but they're, they're completely different. One is blood volume and one is body water. So what are the common causes though? So the common causes of hypovolemia are of course uh, GI bleeding, um, GI problems such as vomiting and diarrhea, burns, excessive urinary output, 
inadequate fluid intake, and medication like diuretics. And so here we're looking at them combined. We're looking at hypovolemia and dehydration combined here. And what are some of the causes of both of these? So how does someone present? Well, symptoms will be present or an individual will present with symptoms when they have mild fluid depletion, less than 5% of their extracellular fluid. And so they're gonna come forward with symptoms or they're gonna present with symptoms such as um, decreased skin turgor, which is the best assessment and you test in the upper torso, dry mucous membranes and oliguria, decreased urine output. And special considerations should be given in elderly patients since skin turgor may be low regardless of their volume status. And we're going to go through um, signs and symptoms a little bit later. So when fluid loss exceeds 10% of the extracellular fluid volume, that's when someone can start to go into hypovolemic shock, only 10%. And this is where the body goes into a shock state where they have an increased respiratory rate, increased rest, um, heart rate, hypotension, they may be confused, poor capillary refill, because the heart is trying to shunt um, blood away from those um, organs that don't really need it and give it to the organs that need it, the brain, the lungs, and the other symptoms include concentrated urine, thirst, nausea, anorexia, and poor capillary refill. Think decreased cardiac output. There's not enough blood for the heart to pump out, and so this is what's happening. In minor hypovolemia, an increase in oral intake of sodium and water can be done for conscious patients to replace the depleted sodium ions. But for more severe cases of hypovolemia, patient treatment includes IV saline um, or a blood transfusion if required. And so treatment modalities depend on the severity of fluid volume deficit. What about hypervolemia or fluid volume excess? So fluid volume excess or hyper, hyper, hypervolemia means someone's taken in an intake, excessive intake of fluids. There's abnormal retention of fluid through heart failure or renal failure. And so the treatment is you want to remove the fluid without changing the electrolyte composition or the osmolality of the ECF. And so typically what will happen is you will give diuretics or fluid restriction are the primary forms of therapy. So restriction of sodium intake may also be indicated as I've said here. And if the fluid excess leads to ascites or pleural effusions or things like that, a thoracentesis may be necessary to remove that extra fluid. So it's very, it's a very, um, it's a very hard balance to keep because you want to remove the fluids, but you also don't want to have these major shifts between the um, extracellular and intercellular fluid compartments. Potential complications of, of being hypervolemic or fluid volume excess, so ineffective airway clearance, risk for impaired skin integrity, disturbed body image, and pulmonary edema and ascites. So let's look at the fluid imbalances and nursing management. So above all else, in and out is the most important. Whether you're working in ICU, step down, um, a regular nursing floor, in and out is going to be your most important of how you're going to figure out the fluid balance in your patient. Other are monitoring the cardiovascular changes, so changes in blood pressure, changes in the heart rate, increase a jugular venous distension, assessing respiratory changes. So extracellular fluid excess can result in pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema. So you're gonna be hearing crackles in the bases, a change in the saturation, an increase in the respiratory rate. Daily weights is very important. This is something that was done consistently on the cardiac surgery unit, looking at daily weights. And an increase in one kilogram or 2.2 pounds is equal to one liter of fluid retention. So this is provided that the person has maintained their usual dietary intake or has not been on MPO status. And so weight changes are a great tool for fluid balance and most heart function patients, they regulate their, the amount of Lasix that they use through their daily weights.
And then skin assessment is extremely important. So assessment of skin turgor. So skin areas over the sternum, the abdomen, and the anterior forearm are the usual sites for evaluation of tissue turgor. A decreased skin turgor is predictive of, it's one of the predictors of fluid deficit, but not so much in older patients because of loss of tissue elasticity. And so how do you assess it? When normal skin is pinched, it resumes the shape in seconds. If the skin remains wrinkled for 20 to 30 seconds, the patient has poor skin turgor. This is something I would consistently do for my cardiac surgery patients. A change in neurological status due to extracellular fluid excess or a deficit can result in cerebral edema, but also cerebral dehydration. And so you do have the changes in level of consciousness. You may have a change in pupillary response, voluntary movements of the extremities due to a change in electrolyte imbalance, muscle strength may change, and there may be a change in reflexes all related to the effect of cerebral edema, dehydration, or re reduced cerebral tissue perfusion. Just one comment on the differences in the fluid spacing. So the first spacing is the normal distribution of fluid in the intracellular and extracellular fluid compartments. Second spacing is abnormal accumulation of interstitial fluid, so this is edema. And then third spacing is fluid accumulation and part of the body where it's not easily exchanged with the extracellular fluid. You see this in areas of ascites, so in the abdomen, in the pleural space with pleural effusions, and in the cardiac spaces with cardiac fluid, so cardiac um, effusions as well, pleural effusions. So moving on to electrolyte imbalances. The two key electrolyte imbalances I want to look at are sodium and potassium. So excess and deficit. An excess of sodium is hypernatremia. You have symptoms of thirst, CNS deterioration, and an increased interstitial fluid. And I'll speak to this soon. And deficits are hyponatremia and your typical CNS deterioration. So you can see how CNS deteriorations are in both. Potassium is hyperkalemia. We worry about our V-fibs, our ECG changes, and our CNS changes. And hypo, or a deficit, we worry about, again, bradycardia, ECG changes, and CNS changes. So you can see cardiac and neural are the, are the top two organs that we're concerned with. So sodium, the normal, normal level is between 135 and 145. As I've said before, it's the primary determinant of extracellular fluid osmolality because it lives in the extracellular fluid. Sodium leaves our body through urine, sweat, and feces. The kidneys are the primary regulator of sodium balance. The serum sodium level reflects the ratio of sodium to water, and it's not necessarily the loss or gain of sodium. And so the, thus changes in the, sodium ser the serum sodium level may reflect a primary water imbalance. And so this is what I want to speak to. It's very important that the sodium imbalance is a water problem. So the serum sodium level reflects the ratio of sodium to water, not necessarily the loss or gain of sodium. And so that's what we're looking at. With a decrease in sodium, we have a less pulling pressure, remember osmosis, and with an excess of water, we have a greater pulling pressure. And so the serum sodium level may reflect a primary water imbalance a primary sodium imbalance or a combination of the two, but it really gives us a good idea of the water problem. So hypernatremia. Hypernatremia is not a problem in an alert person who has access to water, who can sense thirst and is able to swallow. But hypernatremia secondary to water deficiency is often the result of impaired level of consciousness or the inability to obtain fluids. Elevated serum sodium occurs with water loss or sodium gain. So that's where we see it. We've lost a lot of water in our body and the ratio between water and salt has changed. So it, 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 it looks like, or it appears to be, a hypernatremia because we've lost water so the water imbalance 
is in favor of higher sodium levels. Or we could be taking in a lot of sodium, excessive sodium. It causes hyperosmolality leading to cellular dehydration. So water is being pulled out of the cells. Remember sodium lives outside the cells and the extracellular fluid. So you get this cellular dehydration and that's where you start to get your CNS issues. The primary protection is thirst from the hypothalamus and that's our, it turns on our thirst mechanisms to drink. It's also has a role, ADH, also has a role in the posterior pituitary gland. And we're gonna talk about ADH on the next slide. So excessive sodium intake with inadequate water intake can lead to hypernatremia. Examples of sodium and gain, um, examples of taking in too much sodium include IV administration of hypertonic saline, the use of sodium containing drugs, concentrated G2 feeds or NT um, NG feeds without enough water and excessive oral intake of sodium. And we'll talk a little bit more about these as we move forward. So here we're going to talk about the importance of thirst. So the thirst center is located in the hypothalamus. There are two stimuli for true thirst based on water need. They are cellular dehydration caused by an increase in extracellular fluid osmolality and a decrease in effective circulating volume. These two stimulate your thirst center. So a decrease in circulating blood volume is your hemorrhaging. Sensory neurons called, called osmoreceptors are located near the hypothalamus and they respond to changes in the extracellular fluid osmolality by swelling or shrinking. So if the extracellular fluid volume swells, it's, gonna, it's going to give a different signal than if it were to shrink. So it's looking at that volume of extracellular fluid volume. Thirst normally develops when there is as little as a one to 2% change in serum osmolality. And so thirst is one of the earliest signs of hemorrhage and is often presented or is often present before other signs of blood loss appear. So very important about thirst. Equal to thirst is the antidiuretic hormone. So this is also known as vasopressin and it controls the reabsorption of water by the kidneys. It's synthesized in the hypothalamus and it's stored in the posterior pituitary. And how it works is that the pituitary gland secretes antidiuretic hormone, which causes the body to retain water. And so this is just another mechanism to maintain homeostasis with respect to fluid volume. As with thirst, ADH levels are controlled by the extracellular fluid volume and osmolality. Osmoreceptors osmo in the hypothalamus sense changes in the ECF osmolality and stimulate the production and release of ADH and it's a negative feedback system. So if we look at controlling blood osmolality through these two mechanisms, thirst and ADH, with high osmolality, it causes the body to stimulate thirst and you, an individual would increase their water intake. It also increases the ADH release. So you have water reabsorbed from the urine to try and balance the salt and water out. And low osmolality causes a lack of thirst, so decreased water intake and decreased ADH release. So water is lost in the urine. So the question is true or false? Increased levels of ADH decrease urine output. That's true. Remember, ADH is antidiuretic hormone. So it prevents the diuresis by causing more water to be reabsorbed in the kidney tubules. If more water is reabsorbed, there is less water left to eliminate as waste, decreasing the urine, urine output. Hypernatremia. Hypernatremia is characterized by a serum, serum sodium level above 145. It's caused by two things, water deficit or loss from dehydration, burns. You would not believe the amount of water that's released during burns. Fever, watery diarrhea, diabetes insipidus, 
Or number two is sodium administration. So hypertonic solutions to correct a hyponatremia. NG2 feedings are huge for hypernatremia. They're high protein, high, lo uh, high osmolality formulas, and they have large solute loads with too little water. And that's why oftentimes you will be giving fluid water or water flushes in order to give more water because of these really hypertonic solutions. Really important. So what do you see? You see an individual that's thirsty. You see an individual who has concentrated urine. The kidneys are trying to conserve water. There's an increase in urine osmolality as well as blood osmolality. You'll have dry skin and mucous membranes, poor skin turgor, and you'll have cellular dehydration, and you'll specifically see this with your CNS effects. Thirst, again, remember I said thirst is highly, highly effective in preventing hypernatremia. And so hy therefore, hypernatremia is more likely to occur in infants and in persons who do not experience or cannot express their thirst or obtain water to drink. So really important to think about the water intake and the deficits in those individuals. Hypernatremia, as I said before, manifestations, thirst, lethargy, agitation, seizures, and coma, you can see the amount of CNS changes, impaired level of conscious, consciousness, and it's produced by clinical states. So some of the clinical states or clinical disorders that can cause hypernatremia are issues with ADH, so your diabetes insipidus, which we will have a full lecture on. So neurogenic, or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So neurogenic is a deficit in the synthesis or release of ADH. Remember, it's in the uh, it's produced by the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary. And nephrogenic is that the kidneys don't respond to ADH. So those are the big um, uh, concerns with hypernatremia and what could cause them. So what are your nursing implement uh, implementations? Treat the underlying cause. If oral fluids cannot be ingested, IV solution of D5W in water or a hypotonic saline could be given, half strength, half strength normal saline, and restricting the sodium intake. So it's very important that this is done at a gradual way. Serum sodium levels must be reduced gradually to prevent too rapid a shift of water back into the cells. Overly rapid con um, correction of hypernatremia may result in cerebral edema. So it's, very, it's something that's done very slowly. So let's move on to hyponatremia. So this is a serum sodium level less than 135 millimoles per liter. The common causes are water replacement only instead of electrolyte containing liquids. And this is something that we're very concerned about in athletes and marathon runners that they're taking in both an electrolyte and water during the running because you can, it can, if they're a marathoner, it can lead to hyponatremia. Excessive sweating, diarrhea, and vomiting, so loss of water and salt, a water excess. So individuals, maybe this could happen during uh, clients after surgery. They're given a lot of solution or major trauma, uh, maybe during the administration of fluids in clients with renal failure, so unable to excrete the water, or in clients with a psychiatric disorder associated with excessive water intake. The manifestations are similar, confusion, nausea, vomiting, seizures, and coma. So what do you see? In hyponatremia, the cells swell because there's an increase in intercellular water. So I want you to think about what's happening here. So sodium lives in the extracellular fluid compartment. If it's hyponatremic, water is not gonna be pulled into that compartment, but instead it stays in the intracellular fluid compartment and it may actually be pulled into that compartment because it may seem that there's actually more sodium in the intracellular fluid compartment versus the extracellular fluid compartment and you have swelling of cells and so because of water movement hyponatremia produces this increase in intracellular water which is responsible for many of the clinical manifestations of the disorder so muscle cramps weakness and fatigue reflect the effects of hyponatremia on the skeletal muscle function and are often early signs of hyponatremia. 
The cells of the brain and the nervous system are the most seriously affected by increases in intracellular water. Symptoms include lethargy, headache, which can progress to disorientation, confusion, gross motor weakness, and depression of deep tendon reflexes. Seizures and coma occur when serum sodium levels reach extremely low levels. These severe effects, which are caused by cerebral edema, may be irreversible. And so what do you do? Well, it depends on the cause. So the treatment of hyponatremia is determined by the underlying cause. When hyponatremia is caused by water intoxication or water excess, limiting water intake and a fluid restriction is important. The administration of a saline solution orally or intravenously may be needed when hyponatremia is caused by serum deficiency. Symptomatic hyponatremia with neurologic manifestations may be treated with hypertonic saline solution and a loop diuretic. So basically you're pulling water out of the intracellular space and then you're given a diuretic to increase water elimination. This combination allows for correction of serum sodium levels while ridding the body of excess water. Again, the most important thing is a slow correction. Abnormal fluid losses, if that is the cause, it would be fluid replacement with sodium containing solution. Moving on to potassium. So potassium lives in the intracellular fluid. It's necessary for transmission and conduction of nerve and muscle impulses, for cellular growth, for maintenance of cardiac rhythms, and the acid-base balance. So, and it also is the, it also provides homeostasis to the cell membrane through the sodium potassium pump. So really important. Hyperkalemia is a potassium greater than 5.5 millimoles per liter and it's caused by a massive intake, impaired renal excretion, and a shift from the intracellular fluid to extracellular fluid compartment. And it's most common in renal failure. Hyperkalemia is also common in clients with massive cell destruction. So a burn or a crush injury, rapid transfusion of stored hemolyzed blood, and severe infections. Certain drugs such as potassium sparing diuretics and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors such as your enalaprils and your lisinopril's may contribute to the development of hyperkalemia. So what do you see? You see cramping leg pain, weak or paralyzed skeletal muscles, V-fib or cardiac standstill, abnormal cramping or diarrhea, and increased GI motility. So the EC effects of hyperkalemia are down here. The telltale sign of hyperkalemia are these tall peak T waves. Very, very important. In hypokalemia, you might have a little bit of an ST depression and you'll have this T wave, but you actually get this second wave, which is called the U wave. So it's hypokalemia. Hyper are these tall peaked T waves. So how do we treat it? So hyperkalemia is an emergency. In, in emergency situations, you treat it this way with a combination of drugs. Calcium gluconate is given to kind of calm down the cardiac cellular membrane. Remember, calcium is very important in the action potential. Bicarbonate is given because of a metabolic acidosis that happens in hyperkalemia. So think of hyperkalemia as a, an increase in hydrogen ions, which is an acidotic state. The insulin is given to jumpstart or increase the sodium potassium pump and it shifts potassium back into the cells. If you're giving insulin, you need to give glucose because of the concern for hypoglycemia. k exalate is commonly given on the units and it increases GI potassium excretion. It can be given orally or through an enema and dialysis for those individuals in renal failure that need the potassium removed. The nursing impl uh, implementation, you will be important, you, your role will be important for monitoring the potassium intake. So eliminating any oral or any other type of potassium intake 
increasing the elimination of potassium through diuretics, dialysis, and K-exalate, as I've described. Other ways are through IV insulin or sodium bicarbonate, which I've already spoke to. So insulin activates the sodium potassium pump, causing a movement of potassium into the cells. And then the use of calcium carbonate to try and calm down the cardiac membrane, and it prevents the harmful cardiac effects of severe hyperkalemia. Low serum potassium levels, so under 3.5 are caused by abnormal losses of potassium via the kidneys or the GI tract through diuretics, diarrhea, laxative abuse, vomiting. What happens is a shift between the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid compartments, and this causes a metabolic alkalosis. The manifestations, the most serious are cardiac, bradycardia, you have a change in the T wave and the emergence of a U wave, as I've discussed before. Weakness of respiratory muscles, skeletal muscle weakness, and decreased GI motility. Nursing management. You'll be responsible for giving potassium supplements, either orally or IV. You may be running an IV solution with 10 to 20 milliequivalents per hour of potassium. It should not exceed 10 to 20 to prevent hyperkalemia and cardiac arrest. In other cases, you may be given potassium on a one-time basis based on maybe a potassium protocol. The important things to think about with giving potassium is you always check the renal status and the urine output. And so potassium is never given unless there's good urine output of at least 0.5 mils per kilogram of body weight per hour. And if you're giving one-time doses of potassium, the, the preferred maximum concentration is 40 millimoles per liter. However, stronger concentrations may be given for severe hypokalemia up to 80 millimoles per, per liter, but that requires continuous cardiac monitoring. So that is it for our overview of fluid imbalances, potassium and sodium imbalances. So please bring your questions to our Zoom class to discuss anything further.